Yes, good evening, Freedom Church family and friends. Thank you so much for being here tonight on this Easter Sunday with truly so much going on in the world right now. It hardly feels like time for celebration, but I'm reminded every time we're in this space with Freedom Church, uh, what's at stake and the importance of community in this beloved community that we're building and the importance of taking care of our spirit, especially in these difficult times. Um, it's, it's so great, again, to be here. We have uh, amazing testifiers and artists tonight that will be sharing with us, and just so thankful for them for sharing their talents with us, uh, and you for being here to take the time to, to take care of our spirits. I want to pass it to my co-facilitator, Reverend Jess, uh, to read the mission statement of the Freedom Church of the Poor. Thanks, Tony. The Freedom Church of the Poor is a spiritual and political home for movement leaders. We believe in the fundamental dignity and value of all life and in a world of abundance where all can thrive. We gather as a community of faith to support and care for each other. We commit to realizing the abundant world God promises by identifying, developing, and uniting leaders who will build a movement to end poverty led by the poor. In this community and through our commitment to this struggle, we also seek to rediscover and share a vision and practice of religion that is rooted in truth, justice, and love. And we're so grateful you have joined us tonight as we gather to embody that truth, justice, and love this evening, even in the midst of the despair in our world today. I'm Reverend Jess Williams, and I'm with the Cairo Center um, I'm calling in tonight from my, my dad's uh, house where my family has gathered for Easter dinner, um, wearing a, a yellow t-shirt with the Kansas Poor People's Campaign logo on it. And I'm grateful to be here with y'all tonight. I'm going to pass it back to Tony, um, Tony Eskridge with the Tennessee Poor People's Campaign and the 22nd Century to offer us a poem, Life After Death, 331-24. Yeah, thank you for that, Reverend Jess. Uh, yeah, like I said, it's been very overwhelming to just try and be present, I feel like, lately um, with the state of the world and in this season of struggle and lament that we are exiting as we enter the new season of Easter and the promise of resurrection. Uh, 
I spent some time reflecting on what what resurrection really means to us in this moment. Like, how can we how can we one see so much death around us, but also understand uh, the promise of life that happens when we build this movement together? Um, so I wrote this poem, Life After Death, uh, and yeah, let me just get into it. Beloved, do you believe in the life after death? On this holy day, when bombs are dropped around the world, 800 graves are filled at home, we remember death is not the end for us. Resurrection is realignment, is realizing the lies we've been fed about lines on a map showing us versus them, that some human beings are better off dead. They preach U.S. exceptionalism, but if you're broke, you're an exception. They feed us empty words about peace, but when we need to eat, it's crumbs. And instead of housing, they sweep the streets. They keep our wages low, our debts high, and trap us into scarcity mine. They make the guns and fund the wars, but we arm ourselves and lock our doors, lock our shoulders so tense, so tight, and keep an arm's length, can't sleep at night, afraid of losing the little we have, and we call this living, this can't be right, no. There is death in resurrection, but we should not be dying. There must be a correction. Resurrection is a revolution of values to save the world and save our souls. What must die so we may live? The beliefs that keep us shackled to our shame, that tell us we're alone and burdened with the blame, these beliefs must die. A society that normalizes death, that can no longer see the divinity of humanity, that does not cry justice when a mother weeps over her child on October 6, this society must die. A system that fills soul-crushing prisons and not life-saving prescriptions, that pollutes our planet and leaves no path for our young people, this system must die so that we may live. Yes, resurrection is liberation, the life after death, the way when we lay down our fears and open our ears to the untold stories. When we see our neighbors, not as enemies, but as family. When we tell the system nobody's free till everybody's free. When we let ourselves be loved. It is a scary place to be, yet the freest place to be. It means you move different. But teacher Tay says, take good steps. So let's move together. Let us link arms and break every chain, like Martin on the mountain and our leaders before us. Yes, I believe in life after death. Now breathe, now live. We have only just begun. Thank you again for joining us tonight for this Freedom Church service. I now want to uh, open up the space to a song from Mary Hooks from the Movement for Black Lives and Southerners on New Ground. Mary Hooks is a 42-year-old Black, lesbian, feminist, abolitionist, pan-Africanist, mother, wife, and member of Southerners on New Ground and part of the leadership of the Movement for Black Lives. She is passionate about transformative organizing work that changes hearts and minds and has been at the forefront of combating racism by taking on fights that impact the lives of black and brown, queer and trans people in the South, such as the work to abolish money bail, defunding police, reimagining public safety and developing new organizers. When she's not ripening the eyebrows of white supremacy and injustice, you can find Hooks plotting, scheming, and dreaming, but most of all, loving on her people. And a quote, the mandate to avenge the suffering of our ancestors 
to earn the respect of future generations and to be transformed in the service of work. Let's get free, y'all. Amen to that. Uh, let's get this song from Mary Hooks. Thank you. of the ones who did not die we are the children of the ones who did not die and we are the children of the people who could fly and we are the children of the ones who persevered we are fearless we are strong and we're ready to carry on. We are the children of the ones who did not die. And we are the children of the people who could fly. And we are the children of the ones who persevered. We are fearless, we are strong, and we're ready to carry on. We are the children of the ones who did not die. And we are the children of the people who could fly. And we are the children of the ones who persevered. We are fearless, we are strong, and we're ready to carry on. And we're ready to carry on. And we're ready to carry on. Fearless, 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 fearless. And we're ready to carry on. And we're ready to carry on. And we're ready to carry on. We did not die. We did not die. We did not die, and we're ready to carry on, 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 and we're ready to carry on. 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 Whew, Ashe. Amen. And carry on, we will. Thank you, Mary. Excited to now welcome Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, Director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice, to um, lead us in a grounding word this evening. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be with you. And as we know, for Christians like myself, today is Resurrection Day, a day where love is supposed to trample hate where truth is supposed to trounce lies, where hope is supposed to conquer fear and life overcome death. It's a day when resurrection is supposed to win out over war and occupation and all forms of assassination and crucifixion. And yet it's hard to feel that or believe that. With 30,000 Palestinians killed, hundreds of thousands injured, disrupted and displaced, since October, with 800 people dying a day from poverty in these yet to be United States. With policy violence and police violence and war and genocide cutting lives short in this death dealing society, resurrection is distant. It's hard to wish each other a happy Easter. And yet this resurrection day seems to be similar to that original one where the people were living under the Roman occupation of Palestine, where war and violence were rampant, poverty claiming the lives of many, where thousands alongside Jesus were being executed in a death-dealing system. And Jesus' followers go to a tomb, scared and hungry in mourning with despair all around. 
There was no brass music playing. There weren't Easter bonnets and lilies. The kids at the scene didn't carry baskets with eggs or candy. And if anyone was fasting, it was because there wasn't adequate food to eat. Resurrection wasn't preached from the perspective of those on top. It was demanded from those on the bottom. It felt more like this song that we sing where everybody's got the right to live, that everybody's got the right to live. We say poverty no more. We say genocide no more. We demand justice for the poor because everybody's got a right to live. God of justice, you've told us what is good. And that's to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly. We're supposed to do what is right. We're supposed to rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. You've told us to do no wrong or violence to the children or the widows and to not shed innocent blood. We learn in the Bible we're supposed to stop legislating evil and depriving the poor of their rights. We're to give to anyone who asks of the nation to share our clothes and food and resources with anyone who lacks. We're not to extort money from anyone to make no threats or false accusations. We're to pay just wages. We're to organize society around the needs of the least of these who are most of us. And so on this Resurrection Day, I want to pray words from Archbishop Desmond Tutu, writing from apartheid South Africa some years ago, but it feels like so appropriate today. We live in a moral universe. Right and wrong do matter. Truth will out in the end, no matter what happens, no, many, no matter how many guns you use. No matter how many people get killed, it's the truth that freedom will prevail in the end, that injustice, repression, and violence cannot have the last word. This is my pray, my prayer today, this Resurrection Day. Amen. Amen. Truth and freedom will win in the end. Thank you so much, Reverend Liz, for that grounding. Um, now is the time for our special Easter liturgy reading tonight. Uh, we'll have four readers. We have Sierra from the Cairo Center, Asmira from Black Christians for Palestine, Carrie from the New Disabled South, and Jamitha from Million Artists Movement. Thank you all so much for reading. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you to everyone who is joining us today for this service uh, for Gaza. My name is Sierra Taylor. I'm going to have the speakers of this liturgy introduce ourselves before we get in. Um, I'm a black woman, I have blonde hair, a black t-shirt and a black kafia on. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Asmira. I am a Black and Palestinian American woman. I am a sister, daughter, lover, and friend. Grateful to be here. Hi, my name is Perry. I am a white woman with short, shoulder length red hair, and I am and red glasses and wearing a purple dress and I'm grateful to be here today. Peace and blessings. My name is Jayanthi. I am a black East Indian Choctaw woman um, living in the purple Twin Cities. And um, I'm a mother, a daughter, a sister, an auntie, a friend. Um, I will be reading from my phone, so I will turn my camera off, but it's good to see you all. And peace and blessings, good to be here with you all. 
The story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as told by Matthew. And Mark. And Luke. And John. The story of many resurrections and liberation as told by the Freedom Church of the Poor. And your disabled staff. And Adala Justice Project. And Black Christians for Palestine. According to the Gospel of Mark, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices to anoint Jesus' dead body. But when they arrived, the large stone had been rolled away. When they entered the tomb, one dressed in a white robe, addressed them, saying, Jesus has risen. The women were trembling and bewildered and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Afraid of the authorities of empire. Afraid of death-dealing systems. Afraid of being the empire's next victim. Did they go on to Galilee as the one? Did they go on to Galilee as the one dressed in a white robe told them that Jesus did? Did they continue Jesus's movement despite and because of their fear? Will we? Will we? In John's gospel, Mary Magdalene stood outside the empty tomb weeping afraid of what the Roman authorities had done with Jesus's body when Jesus appeared to her and said, do not hold on to me. He then appeared to the disciples and breathed on them to receive the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus appeared to Thomas and told him to believe. In his appearing, Jesus continued to develop other leaders. To build a movement. To point the way toward liberation. Because, because death, death does not, does not have, have the, the last, last word. word. In the Gospel of Matthew, after Jesus appeared to the woman at the tomb, he met the disciples in Galilee and told them to go and organize all the nations, teaching them to obey everything Jesus had commanded to feed, shelter, and provide health care for the people. To cancel all debt. To end state violence, mass incarceration, and military occupation. In the Gospel of Luke, later in the day after Jesus had risen and after he walked with two other leaders on the road to Emmaus, he appeared to the disciples and said, peace be with you. The peace of Christ. A peace of love. A peace of justice. But it is not just Jesus who is resurrected. And resurrections do not just happen on Easter Sunday. Matthew's gospel tells us that at the moment of Jesus' death upon the cross, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. There was an earthquake, and the saints who had gone before were resurrected, even and especially in the midst of violence, destruction, death, and empire. Resurrection happens. Liberation occurs. Movements continue. Leaders persist. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus shows us ways of continuous resurrection by freedom fighters whose lives, teachings, and legacies are sustained through the movements they have built. And so this Easter, we celebrate all our freedom fighters. We celebrate mo moments of resurrection. We celebrate movements of liberation. We celebrate our organizers and leaders in, in, the, in the midst, the midst of, of the violence, violence injustice, injustice, and, and death-dealing system systems, systems around, around us. us.
we celebrate, we celebrate all, those all those who organize, who organize others, others to, toward, toward new life. New life. New life. Amen. Thank you, each one of you. I'm honored now to have the opportunity to introduce Dom Kelly from the New Disabled South. Dom is the co-founder, president, and CEO of New Disabled South, a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and New Disabled South Rising, its 501c4 arm. He has been organizing in the South since 2009, committed to building a progressive future for disabled people in his region. His previous roles as a senior advisor and founding staff of Stacey Abrams' gubernatorial campaign, and as a lead fundraiser and advisor for her voting rights organization, Fair Fight Action, both led him to make his vision for New Disabled South a reality. Dom is one of a set of triplets born with cere cerebral palsy and has been a disability advocate since he was four years old. Starting when he was a young teenager, Dom and his brothers played around the world with their rock band, A Fragile Tomorrow, touring and collaborating with artists like Indigo Girls, Joan Baez, Toad the Wet Sprocket, The Bengals, and more, and releasing six records over 15 plus years. Dom, we're so excited that you can join us this evening and offer us a word. Just a moment, we'll make you a co-host. Okay, there we are. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dom Kelly. I use he, him pronouns. I am a white man with brown curly hair and glasses sitting in front of a couch with some pictures and records on the wall and a bookshelf with some of my favorite books, candles and a fake plant. And I'm wearing a black t-shirt that says Sir Shadon Palestine. Um, I wear this shirt, um, which means free Palestine um, as the grandson of Irish immigrants on my father's side and the ancestor of victims of the Holocaust on my mother's side. I join you tonight in my capacity as co-founder, president and CEO of New Disabled South as a disability justice activist, and as a Jewish person committed to Palestinian liberation. As such, I consider it a profound honor to have been invited to speak at this Easter service, as Easter is not a day that we celebrate in my faith tradition, but one that has an inextricable link to the upcoming holiday of Passover. Upon reflecting on the meanings behind these two holy days, the word hope springs to mind. Both the story of liberation of Jewish slaves that we celebrate on Passover and the story of the resurrection of Jesus that is honored on Easter culminate in a message of hope for the future. Hope that we as humans can together heal a broken world and realize a shared vision of freedom. This week will be six months since the ongoing massacre of Palestinian people began. We have all seen with our own eyes the unfathomable death and destruction. And as a disabled person, I've struggled to wrap my head around the realities of the disabled people in Gaza, those born disabled, those who have been disabled by the ongoing occupation, and those who have been disabled these past six months alone. Prior to the start of this genocide, the UN estimated that 14% of Gaza's population were disabled. Now, we don't need the UN to tell us that today, 100% of Gaza's population is disabled. It's not just that Gaza has, quote, the largest cohort of pediatric amputees in history, as was noted in a recent New Yorker article. It's not just that thousands more have had to live with more chronic illness and physical disability since the destruction began. It's that trauma itself is disabling. Trauma is a disability. Not a single Palestinian in Gaza will come out of this without bearing the scars of trauma, whether, whether physical, mental, or otherwise. And the silence of the broader disability community on Gaza has angered me beyond my ability to properly articulate here. When we recently saw the images of Yazan Kafarna 
the 10 year old boy with cerebral palsy, the same disability I have in an emaciated state before his death, I thought that surely we would finally hear the rallying cries of the broader disability community. And we did not. Let me be clear, anybody claiming to do the work of disability justice who is silent on Gaza is doing no such thing. And so back to hope, how can we hold on to a message of hope, the message of this Easter day, when our government here continues to fund this genocide and when the Palestinian population in Gaza and the West Bank continue to face death and destruction with no end in sight. Truthfully, it is hard to have hope these days. And my glimmer of hope actually comes in moments like this, seeing a multiracial, multi-ethnic, interfaith group of leaders come together to call for a permanent ceasefire and an end to the genocide in Gaza. This evening, I do feel hope that Palestinian liberation not just might happen, but will happen. We will see a free Palestine. So during this most holy period for our world, Ramadan, Easter, our upcoming Passover celebration, let us hold on to this feeling of hope. Let us continue to be steadfast in our commitment to ending this massacre. May we all continue this every day until Palestine is free. Thank you. Thank you, Dom, for those powerful, powerful words and challenge for us. We have now a song, um, Ceasefire Now by Anu Yadav. Anu is an actress, playwright, and cultural worker. She's part of the We Cry Justice Movement Arts Collective at the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice, the Center for Performance and Civic Practice, and the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. She lives in Los Angeles, California. We look forward to this song by Anu, Ceasefire Now. I'm a South Asian woman with dark brown hair curly to my shoulders, brown skin, brown eyes. And uh, my name is Anu Yadav. I'm honored to be here today. As a Hindu, uh, recently I celebrated the festival Holi. It is a celebratory uh, holiday that commemorates the arrival of spring. Uh, it also is really about the triumph of good over evil, of ending all conflicts. And it truly really is about love. I, I think a lot about uh, the idea of bhakti. It is an idea, a concept of love uh, within Hinduism that it's about this unconditional devotion to God and the recognition that all of life is sacred, all of life is, is divine. And that we must treat each other as such. And not just each other as humans, but all of life and the earth itself. So I offer this song as we pray for a ceasefire, an end to all war, and the beginning of a flourishing of our human rights to live with dignity. I offer this song rooted in and inspired by Bhakti, adapting some of the testimonies um, from Gazans. She asked her father, have I died? When he pulled her from the rubble, he told her, you are so alive. Like the moon, you're beautiful. No more hospitals burning. No more children asking why. No more olive trees hurting. No more fire in the sky. 
The hearts have no borders, may love conquer all. We will march together as we heed the call, heed the call. Cease fire, cease fire, cease fire now. Cease fire, cease fire, cease fire now. Cease fire. Cease fire, cease fire. Thank you, Anu, for that beautiful song um, and tying in all these faith traditions into, into this holy season. Um, we're actually going to go into another song now from another great artist in our network, B. Soleil. B. Soleil is a singer-songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, rapper, producer, theomusicologist, and humanitarian that is making an impact on the music industry by fusing together sound and social justice. The artist believes that art as a practice and a way of life has the ability to nurture personal transformation in the creator and in those engaging with the creativity. Their work has been featured in Pulitzer Arts Foundation exhibits on the National Mall and around the world, spanning over 11 countries. B. Soleil's musical aesthetic delivers a message reflecting not only the times in which we live, but also the essence of our hearts. B. Soleil is an artist of and for this moment. Amen to that. I uh, would love to get that shared. Wasting time in the unemployment lines Sitting around, waiting for a promotion Don't you know, talking about a revolution Sounds like a whisper Poor people gonna rise up and get their share Poor people gonna rise up and take what's theirs. Don't you know you better run, 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 Finally, the tables are starting to turn. Yeah. Talking about a revolution. Oh, oh, yeah. Talking about a revolution. Oh, oh. While the stamina and the welfare lies. Crying at the doorsteps of those armies of salvation. Wasting time in the unemployment lines. Sitting around, waiting for a promotion. Don't you know? Talking about a revolution sounds like a whisper. Finally, the tables are starting to turn. Yeah. Talking about a revolution. Finally, the 
Finally the tables are starting to turn, yeah. Talking about a revolution, oh, 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 now. Talking about a revolution, oh, oh, now. Talking about a revolution, oh, oh, now. Talking about a revolution, My spirit is just so full after hearing that. Thank you so much, Be Soleil, for all that you are and sharing that with us tonight. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Representative and Reverend Cori Bush uh, to lead us in a reflection. So Congresswoman Cori Bush is a registered nurse, community activist, organizer, and ordained pastor representing the people of Missouri's first congressional district. Congresswoman Cori is in her second term and the United States House of Representatives, serving on the House Oversight Committee, including as ranking member on the Subcommittee on Economic Growth, Energy Policy, and Regulatory Affairs, and the House Judiciary Committee. She is a fierce advocate for justice everywhere, including in our foreign policy, and is a lead sponsor on the Ceasefire Now Resolution in Congress. Thank you so much, Representative Bush, for being with us tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for the invite. And uh, sorry if my background is noisy, but I'm visiting with family. Um, but happy Resurrection Sunday. Um, happy Easter to everyone. Um, I, uh, yes, I'm Cori Bush, Congresswoman from Missouri's first district. Um, I am a black woman with um, long blue nails and, um, and beautiful uh, brown eyes with lined with some green. I don't even know what that is. Um, but um, I first want to start uh, by thanking Freedom Church of the Poor and a, Proje a Justice Project for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you all tonight. I just want you to know how much I admire, I deeply admire you, and I appreciate all the work, your commitment to humanity that you all are able to accomplish every single day through your service and through your organizations. Um, as a pastor, I know that our communities are better for the work and advocacy that you all do, and our world is so much better for it, too. Um, towards the end of uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's life, in many of his speeches and his writings, he referred, um, and I say this often, but he referred to a concept called the world house. And um, it wasn't his intellectual property, but he spoke about the concept. And so it's the idea that spoke to the interconnectedness of humanity and the need for global solidarity and cooperation. The metaphor of world house, it emphasizes the idea that all people share humanity and must therefore learn to live together as siblings, regardless of their differences and the physical and social boundaries um, that we may experience. And lately, I find myself thinking, you know, about Dr. King's concept a lot, particularly as we witness the devastation and genocide unfolding in Gaza. As we gather together on this Resurrection Sunday, when our hearts are filled with both joy and with sorrow, we come in celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we also carry the weight of the world's pain and the world's suffering. With over 30,000 and reports being at 40,000 Palestinians dead, almost 75,000 people injured, many possibly still under uh, rubble, more than 8,000 people possibly missing. 85% of the population displaced and living amidst this raging famine and starvation. We cannot ignore the suffering happening to our brothers and sisters. The images of, destru of destruction, you all, the cry cries of, of children caught in the crossfire. The stories of mothers desperate to feed their babies who resort 
ha- they have to resort to mixing grass with chicken feed. These horrors. These horrors remind us of the brokenness of our, our world. And all the while, the United States just continues to enable these atrocities, these this genocide with millions of dollars worth of secret secret weapons and arms transfers that bypass Congress. Uh, It it can be easy to lose faith in these times, to feel helpless or even ashamed of our unwanted complicity. It can be difficult to find hope and joy in the face of such devastation, to come together and celebrate when there is so much anguish. Yet it is precisely in times like this and it's, it's, it's in times like these that the message of this day, it rings out with even greater clarity. This is a time of renewal and rebirth. It reminds us that even in the darkest of moments, there is the promise of new life, just as Jesus emerged from the tomb, overcoming death itself. We are reminded that God's love is more powerful than any force of destruction, even when it seems that hope is lost. This day is a reminder to us that hope is always present, waiting to burst out like a seed breaking through the soil. In the midst of extreme death and despair, we must hold on even tighter to our hope. We must remember that God is with us. God is in us, even in the midst of our suffering. We must motivate ourselves to work tirelessly for peace and for justice in our world. And so let us take a moment to now lift up our prayers for the people of Gotham and all those affected by violence and and conflict around the world. To the families hurting right now, not knowing if their loved ones are alive and and to know um, those who are living with the knowledge uh, that they will never see their loved ones again. Um, We pray for hope. We pray for peace. As we continue our celebrations on today, may we allow ourselves to be filled with the hope and be filled with joy as it ultimately, ultimately that will give us the strength that we need to prevail in these darkest times. So on this Resurrection Sunday, we say happy Resurrection Sunday. We say ceasefire now. We say free Palestine. We say free Sudan. We say free Congo. We say free Haiti in every place where injustice exists right now. And we also say that we do this and we do this together. God bless you all. Happy Resurrection. Thank you, Representative Bush. We have St. Louis representing tonight. Next up, we have the Reverend Tracy Blackman. Reverend Blackman is CEO and founder of Hope Builds LLC, a newly launched consultancy for communities, corporations, and congregations eager to build the just and equitable world they imagine. She also serves as theologian in residence for Eden Theological Seminary and chaplain for the central region of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. As a public theologian and ordained minister in the United Church of Christ, with 25 plus years of experience in community health as a registered nurse, Reverend Blackman's life's work focuses on communal resistance to systemic injustice. She served as a local church pastor in both the African Methodist Episcopal Church and the United Church of Christ prior to accepting a call as Associate General Minister and Vice President of the United Church of Christ for seven years, working collaboratively to launch several anchor initiatives for the denomination. Her messages of hope and healing have been received by national and international audiences, including the White House, the Carter Center, and the Pontifical Council of the Vatican. Thank you for joining us tonight, Reverend Blackman. Thank you for having me. Um, My name is Tracy Blackman. I am a Black woman with graying, increasingly graying locks, Um, and I am wearing a collar tonight, something that I don't uh, do often enough, I guess, and so grateful to be here with 
all of you and um, inspired by the music I've heard and the words that I've heard and want to give a shout out to the one that I think is the best Congresswoman there is uh, serving us right now. Um, and I'm so grateful that she serves as a pastor uh, as well as a legislative leader. We don't say that enough uh, that she's grounded and rooted well. I'm honored to be in this holy space with you this evening to reflect briefly on what's been on my heart um, this resurrection season. As a matter of fact, for the first time that I can remember in my life, I did not attend church today. Um, I just didn't. Not because I don't believe in the resurrection and not because I'm not hopeful, uh, but because sometimes the glossing over just gets to be a bit too much. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what resurrection faith might look like in a Good Friday world, <laughs> because this is what we're facing. There's an empty tomb in Jerusalem to bear witness to one whom I believe is not bothered with the arbitrary divisions and misguided theologies we have used to create for ourselves a God who cares for some more than others. There's an empty tomb in Jerusalem to bear witness to one whose power and love cannot be contained within the walls of a tomb or by a boulder blocking the pathway or by soldiers standing guard or by oppressive systems that only need him to die, not only need him to die physically, but the memory of his very being must be fake, thus be diminished and created as a fable to decrease force. There's an empty tomb in Jerusalem, a borrowed tomb that speaks to the economic inequities that so often accompany those who are marginalized and disenfranchised, even in their own home. Jesus is not the first to easily die in a place where it is challenging to live. There is an empty tomb in Jerusalem, a borrowed tomb from which a stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out, but to let the women peer in and know that not even death can stop the truth from rising. And yet I remain cautiously cognizant that I am neither Palestinian or Israeli, nor Muslim or Jew, and the gift of the American Christian empire, even to those of us twice kissed by the sun, is to celebrate the message of an empty tomb and dismiss the meaning of a Messiah resurrected with wounds. Nadia Bose Weber says, Jesus was resurrected in wounded body. I know our Easter plays leave the blood at the crucifixion, but it means something, my friends, that the one who conquered death shows back up still wounded. Not scarred, but wounded. Scars are an indication of healing. The presence of scars signal past hurts that are now resolved, but Jesus does not show up with scars. Jesus comes back wounded. Wounds so deep that he invites Thomas to place his hands inside. So I invite you into my questions this Easter. There's an empty tomb in Jerusalem while mass graves are filling Gaza. Children buried under rubble, Death comes to the thousands by slaughter and starvation. Crucifixion is not the empire's only weapon. Silence and stagnation are weapons too. And so I ask this evening, who will roll away these stones? For I believe this is the message of the resurrection as well. What might it take to heal a risen savior? And what does resurrection look like for those of us left behind? How does the message of Easter cause us to do more than celebrate the rising of the Messiah? How does the resurrection message cause us to rise as well? I am mindful 
that unlike the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, there are no crowds, there are no palms, there are no parades at the resurrection. There are no eyewitnesses to what Jesus has done. What do we make of a resurrection in a Good Friday world? No one saw Jesus get up. No one saw Jesus get out. The question, my friends, for me is not what does resurrection mean for Jesus? I know Paul says that Jesus got up with all power, but the truth is Jesus had power before he laid down. Jesus had power to resurrect Lazarus. Jesus had power to heal the sick. Jesus had power to bring justice to women who had been marginalized and cast aside. Jesus had power. And the only time that we see in scripture that Jesus willingly submits that power into someone else's control is when he asks the father to hold it for a minute. But what does the resurrection give us? Perhaps the resurrection of Jesus also means that we too might be resurrected, that we might rise and realize the power that is ours, that we too might speak truth to justice, that we too might call our government into task for their complicitness in genocide, not just in Gaza, but all over this world. You know, at that first Easter, it was hard for people to believe that Jesus had returned. It was hard for them to believe the story even when the women came. So Jesus shows himself over and over again. And because Jesus shows himself, the evidence of the resurrection lives on in the changed lives of those who have seen him. I pray that we just won't find eggs and blow balloons and have our lilies and have our parades, but we will keep our eyes out for Jesus. For whenever the people see Jesus, the people rise. May it be so, amen. Amen. Let us keep Jesus in our hearts. Thank you so much, Reverend Blackman, for that, for that reflection. Um, and I'll be introducing another song we'll have lined up tonight, uh, In Jerusalem by Mahoud Darwish, done by Sierra Taylor and John Wilson McCoy. John Wilson McCoy reflects on the idea of a new and unsettling force, and ultimately, who gets to lead a revolutionary movement. John references Luke 22, 47 through Luke 23, 57, and Black Reconstruction in America by W.E.B. Du Bois. John Wilson McCoy is a leader and educator of the history and political strategy team of the University of the Poor and a former co-coordinator of policy, poverty scholarship and leadership development at the Cairo Center. He develops relationships with grassroots community, religious, and labor leaders nationwide. In addition, he researches and develops curriculum focused on history, particularly focused on lessons from the abolitionist movement. And Sierra Taylor, an artist, organizer, and political educator with the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice, University of the Poor, and the Set It Off movement. Please, let's get that song up. I'm so excited to hear it. In Jerusalem by Palestinian poet laureate Mahmoud Darwish. 
in Jerusalem, and I mean within the ancient walls, I walk from one epic to another without a memory to guide me. The prophets are over there sharing the history of the holy, ascending to heaven and returning less discouraged and melancholy because love and peace are holy and are coming to town. I was walking down a slope and thinking to myself, how do the narrators disagree over what light said about a stone? Is it from a dimly lit stone that wars flare up? I walk in my sleep, I stare in my sleep. No one is behind me, no one ahead. All this light is for me. I walk, I become lighter, I fly, then I become another transfigured Words sprout like grass from the messenger Isaiah's mouth. If you don't believe, you? I said you killed me, and I forgot, like you, to die. Thank you for sharing that. Now we'll have a reading uh, from Sandra Tamari. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, everyone. Um, I am a Palestinian woman. I have dark brown eyes and brown curly hair. And I come to you from my home near St. Louis, really moved uh, to have my sisters and struggle from St. Louis speak before me. Um, when we were planning this, I said, there really isn't anything more to say. What we've said it all. So I think that I'm just going to read to you uh, some words by a young writer from Gaza. Her name was Heba Aboneta. She was born in June 20, I'm sorry, June 1991. She wrote novels. Her first novel, Oxygen is Not for the Dead, was published in 2017. And on the evening of October 20th, Heba was martyred with her family under bombardment in their home in the Manada neighborhood of Khan Yunus. And I'm going to read to you today excerpts of her diary entries from October 7th to October 20th. October 9, 4.50 p.m. In every previous war, there was some kind of pattern to the entity's targets. One time it would be families, other times mosques. Another time streets, another time border areas or town centers, another time high rises. There was some kind of plan for the explosions that we could grasp. We the ones under explosions and based on what we would deduce, we could deduce the goals and the trajectory and how long we could expect the war to last. This time there's no pattern. Everything is being bombed. Every precious war being squeezed into this war. Gaza from the north to the south being bombed in a chaotic, catastrophic manner, mass butchery, senseless assassination of everything. But it is our endurance and our faith in God that allows us to look at the plains and become calm before we start to cry. Or when we start to cry after the silence and say, oh God, we have no one but you. October 9th, 6.30 p.m. Dear friends, we are entering a chapter in which we will be isolated from the world so that the city can be eradicated in the shortest possible time. A time when we won't be allowed to communicate with anyone inside or outside of the city. 
Night hasn't fallen yet and the shelling is like hell. Until then, cover us in a flood of prayer and send a message or even a word of steadfastness and freedom on our behalf. We entrust Gaza and everything within her to God, the guardian, the almighty. October 11, 11 a.m. Gaza did everything she could to confront this oppression. She surpassed imagination, rose above the limits of the possible and impossible, smashed all the statues and prohibitions, invented a steadfastness that will be taught in history and ascribed to Gaza. And when the lies are shed and the politicians and their hypocrisy fall away and porcelain humanity collapses in on itself, Gaza will remain an incomprehensible, impossible legend, a world record that cities, civilizations, armies might only attain in an era of prophets and miracles. We have done what we must to reclaim our rights, to fight, to endure on behalf of the nation and all the oppressed in this world. There is nothing to regret or grieve. Before God and before ourselves, we are people with rightful claim. Our duty in this covenant was to endure and to strike. Everything else is left to God. In him we have faith, in him we trust. If we perish, it is a badge of honor. And if we survive, let us tell the tale and bring our story before the eyes of the entire world. Between the two, we have our rituals, tears, patience, sadness, remembrance, hope, and despair. And if we die to speak on our behalf, there were people here who dreamt of travel and love and life and other things. We are under the plains and God is higher than they are and higher than they are. October 15th, we are above building a second city, doctors without patients or blood, professors without overcrowding and yelling at students, new families without pain or sadness, journalists photogra photographing paradise, and poets writing about eternal love, all of them from Gaza, all of them in heaven. A new Gaza, unbesieged, is coming into being. October 20th, 4.52 p.m. Before God, we in Gaza are either martyrs or witnesses to liberation, and we all wait to learn where we fall. We are waiting, O oh God. Your vow is true. We carry these powerful words with us as we enter into a time of prayer. Would you pray with me? Oh God, in this time of suffering, in his time of suffering, Jesus called out to you saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God, this day in the midst of poverty, violence and genocide, your people are crying out, why, oh God, have you forsaken us? Yet we know, God, that death and evil, suffering and oppression do not have the last word. We know that there is resurrection. And new life through every movement and every generation for those who seek love, truth, justice, and liberation, just as Jesus did. So now, God, we ask for your healing, love, and liberation to come to those requests that we lift up now by name. We pray that the Reject APAC Congress people keep their seats. We pray for peace in the heart of one of our Freedom Church family as they acknowledge the sixth anniversary and for safety during traveling and creating a healing ritual to mark
just to continue lifting up some of these prayers that folks have uh, entered into the chat from YouTube. Um, we are praying for peace in Stephanie's heart as they acknowledge the sixth anniversary of the loss to their partner due to an overdose. Prayers for safety as they travel this week and create a healing ritual to mark that loss. Sending so much prayers your way, Stephanie. Prayers to Paula, um, to Paula Roderick's friend who lost family in Israel's bombing of Rafa last week. Also lifting up uh, this beautiful um, piece from Kenya Alcocer, Happy Easter and made today with Jesus's resurrection. We resurrect our revolutionary hope for a better world, our solidarity with the struggles of the oppressed and above all, the love for the poor, not because they are good, but because they are poor. Long live the God of the poor. Sending so much power and love to the beautiful people of Palestine, both in Palestine and to our leaders in the diaspora who have been teaching us all how to struggle for liberation and how to be leaders of this movement. As we move to a close, wanting to share with you all some ways to get involved um, as always. We'll put a link into the chat to donate to the Adala Justice Project. They've been leading us in incredible work, incredible actions all across the country. I'm here in New York City and they um, helped to lead along with the Palestinian Youth Movement and Jewish Voice for Peace, um, the protests that took place during um, Genocide Joe's fundraiser in New York City a couple of days ago. We are also lifting up uh, a Ramadan appeal for Gaza by UNRWA. This Ramadan, the people of Gaza face unbearable challenges, deprived of a nourishing meal and even a sip of water to sustain them. Families are fasting during the day and starving in the evening. And, you know, our support means more than ever now that their funding has been cut off. We're also including in the chat the link to learn more about New Disabled South. I appreciate the leaders of New Disabled South so much for not only enjoy, joining our service uh, this afternoon, but also spending time with us to uh, teach us um, and, and help us to guide uh, accessibility uh, in this service. And I look forward to collaborating with them more in the future. We also have a link to sign up to join Black Christians for Palestine and another link to sign up for Freedom Church of the Poor. This is the last service of our Linton series that we've partnered on with the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, Friends of Sibyl North America, Black Christians for Palestine, Dream Defenders Sunday School, the National Council of Churches, and faith for black lives. But our services will continue on as usual every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern and our Bible studies that take place Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much to Black Christians for Palestine for holding down that space during this Lenten season. And last but not least, always uh, to find and post actions uh, about Gaza, please go to www.gazaispalestine.com slash protest. And uh, so thank you all again for joining. We're going to move into our closing song and we'll have Tony introduce um, Steph Reed, who is going to be sharing to close us out.
Yes, thank you for those calls to action. And thank you again, uh, friends and family of the Freedom Church for being with us tonight uh, on this Easter Sunday. Um, so a little bit about Steph. Steph Reed is a musician, educator, and activist. By sharing his story, Reed shows others that they are not alone. He's a black man that loves and gives greatly, modeling that emotional sensitivity and compassion can make us stronger as a community. As a singer, songwriter, producer, and multi-instrumentalist, Steph Reed is known to affect audiences with his spiritual uplifting energy and song. He is unafraid to be vulnerable and open in his own story, sharing lessons of resilience, healing, self-betterment. Reed blends genres of folk rock, alternative rock, pop rock to culminate in inspirational humanitarian messages. No better way than to close out this service. Let's hear the song. Uh, you want me to share it, Polly? I have it, but it's not allowing me to share a sound. Let me try to share it, and then if my internet goes out, we'll use Adam's. How's that? Sorry, everyone. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you all. Just want to thank you for a powerful service tonight. Uh, my name is Adam. I'm at the Cairo Center, white man with glasses, uh, wearing a button up shirt tonight. And I want to pray that we take the love and strength that we've gathered here tonight and go out again tomorrow to care for each other, to care for each other's wounds, and to go out with love and rise together. Amen. <laughs>